So this is what it's like with the news cycle. So literally within seconds of finishing the recording of last week's show, mm -hmm. Woody Allen's book publisher dropped the book. Yeah. Like, and it's a funny just, thing because you, as you came in, you yeah. were telling me you had yeah. just pre-ordered the I book. Know. I know. It's and unbelievable. Boom, 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 boom. I was, an odd, so odd thing. When you told me you pre-ordered the book, I was yeah. like, wow. Yeah. Published, got the ball to publish Woody's book, yeah. and I was all proud. And uh, less than an hour later... I am so ashamed of Hachette. I, I'm so ashamed. That's the publisher? It's just the publisher. That is so cowardly. They they try to make it sound like, well, we value our relationships with our staffers, and they all complain. I'm, I, and I'm thinking, you know what? Fire them. Just mm -hmm. fire every last one of them, because if you're a staffer at a publishing house, you really don't have any business to, uh, have, weighing in on what the what the publishing house publishes. You really don't. If you don't like it, get a job elsewhere. Yeah, work and, for Larry, Larry Flint or somebody. Yeah, look, if you if you're if you're a senior vice president, I mean staffers. I don't know what they mean by staffers, but but look, like, there are people for, in the context of a publishing company for whom these are questions and issues, and 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 and, and uh, yeah, the, the receptionist isn't in, one of them. In every company, there are two classes of people: the people who make decisions and the people who live with who, decisions. who execute the decisions or quit and or go quit and go else. away. Yeah. I mean, it's not a democracy. I'm sorry, it just isn't. You don't, you don't get a say, and uh, that's very disappointing. And uh, I, I just find that so cowardly. And uh, somebody else will pick it up. And somebody then there's that. And there. then there's that. The thing in the thing in and of itself. Um, there's some snotty staff staffer. This was reported by Vox. This snotty little staffer. Um, man, I would just love to dox the hell out of this person uh, who had the temerity to say we want to cancel the book. It's like, wait a minute, hold on a second. And, and apart from your, your ridiculous demand of a, an apology from the CEO, you want to cancel the book? You want to prevent me from making my own decision about mm. the book, from mm. getting it, from reading it, making my own mind up? You want to prevent that? And, 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 you want and, to control that? How that, is that different that from That baseline Bernie? thing is what they seem to not get. You don't understand that this is not, it's not, a, it's not your decision whether or not no. I, and by, by, by we, we mean you, you over sitting there, Wade and Tim sitting here. You don't decide whether or not we get the Woody Allen's book. Woody Allen is not Roman Polanski. He is a, an innocent man in a country that says innocent till proven guilty. He was, uh, he was not charged. He was looked at, and they did not charge him. Let me be super-duper clear. If he were, like, guilty as hell, you know what you still don't get to do? Cancel, Cancel his book. book. Uh, yeah. you, we don't do that here. He's not, by the way. But, but, but nevertheless, I, if he was writing from prison, you yeah. still don't get to cancel his book. No. We don't do that here. What you get to do is not buy that book. That's it. And then that company, if, if, if there's a punishment that comes, it'll be that, God damn, we printed 10,000 copies of that book. Nobody wanted it. And, 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 and if there's a punishment to the CEO, that's your punishment. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if you print that book and, and 10,000 people buy it, well, then we did the right thing because I'm people just, wanted that book. I am stunned at these people, at these staffers, at these companies who think that they have this kind of power. It's, it's not it, a democracy. It's all in in, in, in the sort of logical philosophical reasoning. Look, I got I got I got two three copies of Mein Kampf around this apartment right here, uh, where I live. Because I'm because amazed. we do not live there. We don't make decisions like that um, here in America. So that's a failure. That's a big fail. A big failure. It's uh, on the part of uh, both those who would want to cancel and those yeah. who would allow it to happen. Yeah. Well, I I I'm I'm not going to stand for it. Yeah, you just get to, am, what you get to do is not buy the book. That's all you get. Not going to gonna stand for it. Well, with with that fun uh, note, uh, I'm going to start off with some music this week. Blow through some Naxos classical stuff, of which there is a fair amount, and it is all really, really good this week. And then uh, i got a couple other things that are not necessarily classical. Opus Arte is, of all the lines that Naxos carries, is really just one of the best. They keep getting some really wonderful performances. This is all Blu-ray. 
Uh, the from the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet in London is La Bayadere, which is uh, absolutely beautiful and uh, so magnificently put together. Some of the most superb dancing you will ever see. It's based on a uh, a, a classic um, Natalia Makarova nineteenth uh, century ballet. It is it's one I've I've seen a, a couple of times previously. This is easily one of the best. Absolutely spectacular and beautiful. Some of the best dancing you'll ever see. Some of the most um, creative ballet. Verdi's La Traviata needs needs no introduction. That's also from the Royal Opera in London. Uh, directed by Richard Eyre, who has done a number of movies and uh, who is an absolutely superb director. I've been wondering, why hasn't he done any more movies? You know, he did the, uh, mm. the one with um, Kate uh, Winslet and Judy Dench as... Mm. The same uh, famous figure, old and young. Oh, yeah, you remember? I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, look that up. Uh, Richard Eyre did that. A very good film from probably about fifteen years ago. And uh, he's, you know, I always forget he's he's a really really good opera director too. So uh, Placido Domingo is in this, and it's uh, it is it is a, a wonderful version of La Traviata. Also from the Royal Opera House and the Royal Ballet is something I'm less familiar with. Um, the it's a, a combination of uh, things from within the golden hour, Medusa, and flight pattern. I'm not familiar with any of it. Um, it's it can, this is contemporary ballet and uh, some interesting stuff. Didn't quite light me on fire just because the music isn't my thing. Um, the most interesting of all of them, obviously, is Medusa, which is inspired by the the myth. Uh, and um, the the choreographer here is Sidi Larbi Sherkawi. And um, uh, it, it, it's all done to this kind of weird uh, techno score that didn't, it's a little too modern for me. But, you know, if you, it's, it's solid dancing. It's just not necessarily my style. Uh, and then there is, this is absolutely excellent. This is Written on Skin, Lessons in Love and Violence. This is the, uh, the orchestra of the Royal Opera House and, and the Royal Opera, uh, directed by uh, Katie Mitchell and conducted by George Benjamin. This is a um, a modern opera uh, in two parts, uh, at least as I understand it. A little bit kind of hard to follow. It written on skin and lessons in love and violence. They are two two separate uh, pieces to like a single a single corpus, I guess it is, and um, it's thematically tied together and uh, written by George Benjamin and Martin uh, Crimp together. And um, it, it's, it's a little weird. I still have a problem sometimes with modern operas because I don't quite follow, you know, opera feels like it belongs in a different era. That being said, there's some very, very interesting stuff going on here um, uh, thematically and narratively. Gets into, you know, the, uh, the relationship between Edward II and uh, Pierre Gaveston in uh, Lessons in Love and Violence, which is um, all a very, ed- you know, recent Edwardian history. Um, written on skin is, all, you know, very very timely. All about the the impact of wealth on your family and your personal relationships. So, um, you know, modern opera can be very very challenging. And written on skin and lessons in love and violence are two of them. Iris. Oh, there it is. That's the film. Two thousand one. Can you believe that? That's why I couldn't remember it. <laughs> it was Dude, damn near twenty see, years ago. Oh my see, god. We see one hundred and fifty movies a year. Yeah. Uh, not including all the Blu-ray and DVD stuff, yeah. not including streaming. So mm-hmm. you know, you up that to to over two hundred. We're that's two thousand movies ago. Yeah, that's a, yeah, a little that's hard fine. to keep track of those things. But yeah. yes, Iris. Yet, yet now it all comes flooding back to me. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so anyway, then we also have uh, Gallery Dore, the uh, tricentennial concert or the concert of the Loge uh, from uh, from Paris. This was filmed in the actual. Um, uh, Golden Gallery in uh, Paris, which is one of you know the eight hundred thousand historic uh, wonders of the world that you have in Paris. But it's uh, it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful concert. Uh, features a lot of extraordinary uh, musicians and performers in this wonderful, wonderful uh, environment. And um, it's just it's something to put on in the background and just sort of enjoy classical music in a wonderful uh, classical location. Volume two of Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts with the New York Philharmonic. Love those. Uh, they're so good, aren't they? 
Uh, this is four Blu-rays, and uh, we, of course, have a Leonard Bernstein movie on the way, a biopic on the way, uh, courtesy of Bradley Cooper, who is going to direct the film and play Bernstein, which mm. I, I know our friend David Ehrenstein, who's a big Bernstein fan, mm -hmm. has a problem with that, mm. but I actually think it's really good. I like Bradley Cooper as an actor, a writer, as a, a, a quadruple threat. Mm. But I also think he looks like Bernstein. Yeah, at a certain age. Yeah. At a certain age. Yeah. That young Bernstein, I, I think I think Cooper's going to kill it. I mean, Lenny was not what you call buff. Yeah. Uh, so if I no. were Bradley, I'd, he, he needs to lose 30 or 40 pounds. He'll do it. Uh, and lean up. And then, He'll yeah, he's, he's got that Lenny thing. He'll do it. You know, he beefed up for American or, Sniper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He can, he can yeah. do that. Yeah. He can do that. He's not going to go Christian Bale on us, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. He can he can he can go a little macrobiotic for a few months, <laughs> which we, which we all need to do. <laughs> which we all, all do need to do. Um, but anyway, this was something, of course, that that aired on television in the, uh, throughout the 1960s. Uh, it started in the 50s, ended in the 70s, 58 to 72. But basically, it's a phenomenon of the 60s. And um, uh, Leonard Bernstein made over 50 of these programs that were that sort of brought classical music into the average American home and and exposed you know young people to classical music in a in a vibrant way uh, that had never been ha never happened before. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. So this is volume two, uh, four Blu-rays, and uh, it'll it'll just it'll touch your heart and you'll fall in love with the music and the people and Bernstein in particular. It's great, just absolutely great. Um, we also have from Bel Air. Um, Traviata, vous méritez un avenir meilleur, which is based on La Traviata, but it's also based on La Dame aux Camélia by the uh, by Alexander Dumas fils, the son. So it's uh, it's kind of uh, it's sort of interesting. I'm I'm not familiar with the Dumas piece that they use to sort of um, fold it into, but if you are familiar with La Traviata, it's very very interesting. What I'd be curious to find out is this is this is made by um, this is directed by Corentin Leconte. I'd be curious to know if that's any relationship to Patrice Leconte. I suspect not, but nonetheless, um, it's uh, it is a very interesting variation on the on the Traviata theme. Uh, Swan Lake, Tchaikovsky Swan Lake needs no no introduction. This is the ballet company, the National Opera of Ukraine. It's just always amazing. I don't know if it's the best Swan Lake. They're all kind of amazing, but it's uh, it's pretty great. And um, you know, you can't go wrong with any of them. Uh, two more on the classical front is uh, the Well Tempered Clav uh, Clavier, Book Two, and Sir Andras Schiff on piano. Uh, the, uh, the, the Johann Sebastian Bach um, Well Tempered Clavier is is absolutely or Clavier however you want to pronounce it, is, is you know, beautiful, classic music. Uh, Andres Schaff, uh, Schiff, not a pianist I'm familiar with, clearly not British, but a sir. I don't quite know the deal. But anyway, this was at the um, 2018 proms at the Royal Albert Hall, which is an annual thing. And uh, all I know is this. I just love listening to really well-performed Bach, and uh, that's what this is. So not someone I'm familiar with. Not an event I'm overly familiar with, but pretty great to listen to. And then Christian Thielemann uh, and the Staatskapelle Dresden from Germany playing the complete symphonies of Schumann. And this is beautiful. I love Schumann's operas, uh, all four of them. I'm a huge fan of, of Thielemann, and uh, I just think this is, uh, this is wonderful. So, you know, put it on, watch it, and let it roll in the background. And the last two on the music front is CMA Awards Live, Greatest Moments from 2008 to 2015. This is on Blu-ray. Lots of great uh, country music here that uh, performed live at the CMAs, which is a really good awards show. It's just the, it's the awards show that doesn't take itself too seriously. It understands it's only doing country music. Everybody's really nice and polite to each other because they're country people. And uh, Keith Urban and uh, Reba McIntyre and, and, you know, uh, Brad Paisley and Carrie Underwood and uh, Kelly Clarkson even shows up with Jason Aldean for some strange reason. Loretta Lynn. I mean, it's, it's you know, George Strait and Alan Jackson. It's just great. It's really, really great. There's a lot of st good stuff here. And um, uh, Blake Shelton. And then lastly... Uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in concert. This is 164 performances on six Blu-rays from 2010 to 2017. Uh, you know, eight different induction ceremonies and everything that goes with them. It's really, really awesome. Uh, Time Life just nailed it with this one. 
it, it, there's almost nothing that's missing here. You could just watch this for hours and hours and hours. And that's a really cool thing is that people forget the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, when they have their induction concerts, it, they make it look like everybody kind of got together at the yeah. last minute and just said, oh, let's just go have a jam session. It looks like that. Yeah. They work their asses off to prepare for these performances. Yeah. They really do. And they take them very seriously because it's an honor. You're not paid for when you're performing there. You're pay- you're performing for the people who've honored you. Yeah. It's a little slightly different dynamic. Yeah, so. Complications over there at the old um, Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, with the Academy, actually. Yeah. Not the Hall of Fame so yeah. much, per se, yeah. but the Academy, yeah. True. That's, yeah. A, that's a bit of a mess right yeah. now, that yeah. fiasco. But anyway, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in concert uh, on Blu-ray. Terrific. Well done, Time Life. Shall we move on to uh, well? First, I'm gonna knock off a few docs. Yeah, right? and then we've got some. We got uh, we got, some, we got some, a few some, docs. Some, some interesting TDE uh, type stuff to do. Uh, um, Ray's hell, the life and times of Molly Ivins. I remember talking about this particular doc on the show. Molly Ivins, of course, the larger than life, literally over six yeah. feet tall, Texas uh, firebrand reporter. <laughs> yeah, uh, late '60s, '70s, '80s. I kind of remember from the '80s. That's when I started picking up on Molly Ivins. I remember when Lloyd Benson. Uh, senator from Texas was running for, yeah. uh, well, vice president, I guess he was on the ticket, sure. uh, and Molly Ivins covering him. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. It, it, we forget sometimes how democratic, how blue the state of Texas was. Ann Richards, uh, yeah. governor of Texas, blue. Yeah. Years and years and years and years. Lyndon Bain Johnson, you know, he came yeah. up out of Tennessee, Oklahoma, but, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And Ma- Molly Ivins was one of these big sort of unabashedly uh, democratic uh, blue Texans. Uh, and she wrote very un- uh, yeah, unapologetically from that point of view, and that's sort of covered in this doc. Interesting thing about Molly Ivins, did you know this about Molly Ivins, the big, the big uh, firebrand Texas reporter? Uh, she's from Petaluma, California. No kidding. Born and raised. Are you serious? Petaluma, California. No so all kidding. that Texas thing, and sure, I guess you moved to Texas and you Let allow you yourself something. to, you know. Let me tell you something. I'm born and raised in California. I still don't know where Petaluma is. <laughs> I don't. It's, it's, it's Wine Owner Rider. I've, yeah. actually, I've actually been there. It's an interesting I, thing. Where, where is it? Uh, a little bit up north, uh, below uh, Santa Barbara. Oh, but, see, uh, I, yeah, no yeah, idea. Yeah, above San Jose. No uh, idea. Petaluma. Uh, there's nothing there but cabbage and, you know. Uh, but Molly Ivins, that, that sort of, so that sort of Texas persona, that's an interesting thing, given where she was actually from. Um, uh, you, you know, I suppose it might be said that she was one of the first reporters who wore her uh, uh, political leanings uh, uh, on her sleeve. She was a wonderful writer. Clever turns of phrase everywhere. They're all over this wonderful documentary. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, Molly Ivins, The Life and Times. Uh, you got one? After Parkland from Kino Lorber. Uh, dealing, of course, with the uh, the shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in which 17 people died. And uh, the After Parkland is... is um, was shot for, for over the course of a year after the shooting, and uh, it interviews just about everyone who wanted to be interviewed, obviously for something like this, to um, to sort of raise awareness. It it's not it is a it is an activist film. It is not trying to give you any kind of balanced argument about gun control, and it doesn't mean to, and it doesn't pretend to. What it says is this was an event that happened. These are the people impacted by it, and here's how it impacted them. And that is certainly fodder for its own mm. uh, discussion, yeah. um, uh, but it, it it puts human face on it, and it is a it is a worthwhile film to watch. It was just in the mix as, last. Uh, it was award season. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot, so many good docs now. It's just so hard for some of them to break out. But yeah, it's after Parkland had a great run at festivals, and it's very very worth seeing. Uh, before St- uh, before Stonewall, uh, yeah, good uh, restored documentary. This is newly restored. A film about the 1969, June uh, 27th and 28th, 1969, uh, raid on the gay bar, Stonewall. Sure, the start of the City. gay rights movement. Start of the gay rights movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Just about uh, many of the people who uh, were there that evening over those those few evenings uh, are in this documentary. And that's what's fascinating about it. It's them describing the situation, what life had been like before and after those events uh, in their own words. Um, uh, the making of a gay and lesbian community. These are you know, look. It's 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 astounding that from 1969 to 20 you know 19 20, 20 uh, how far we've come. Pete Buttigieg, yeah, just well, I guess he dropped out by the time yeah. this airs. Yeah, uh, of the uh, of a race for president of the United States, and he had a pretty good shot at it there for a while. 
Uh, certainly, for it, a was, minute. it was not remotely ludicrous that he was running. Yeah, uh, He was on the debate stage, I think, every time. I think he did Pretty whatever much. it took to get on that debate yeah. stage every single time. So from 1969, these events to him on that stage, uh, you know, giving his husband a big old hug and a kiss. Uh, what is that, 50 years later? 59? Yeah, 19, 50 about years that. About 50 years about later? 50 years later. Right, I, a decent amount of movement on the subject is what I would say. What do you got there? Got the cellist, uh, the legacy of Gregor Piatigorsky. Uh, if you'd never heard of P Gregor Piatigorsky, he was Yo-Yo Ma before there was Yo-Yo Ma. No. And the first person to tell you that is Yo-Yo Ma, uh, who is interviewed on this really, really wonderful uh, doc. It's 103 minutes long. And it's just, it's a, it's a very, very workmanlike, unremarkable in craft, but remarkable in subject matter, portrait of a, uh, an astonishing figure in the world of classical music. Um, you learn a lot too, not just about the music and the people and the world, but but you learn a lot about the cello mm. itself as an instrument, mm. which I which I am really appreciative of. Um, my wife loves the sound of the cello, and and uh, I think I love it even more now too. Um, also have the Oscar nominated "The Cave" from the same director who did us previously, "The Last Men in Aleppo." Um, the Cave was one of two Syrian-themed documentaries that mm. were uh, nominated uh, for the Academy Award this last year. Uh, the Cave is from National Geographic, and it is a harrowing, harrowing, really, really difficult film to watch. Um, I, of course, was very wrapped into this because we had our short, which is a Syrian refugee-themed narrative short that connects to both uh, For Sama and The Cave. Our short is about a mother and her daughter. The mother is a physician, a pediatrician. The Cave is about a woman, a Syrian doctor, a female Syrian doctor, and Forsam is about a woman and her daughter. And, so, and her husband, who's a Syrian doctor. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, we had all kinds of common DNA with these films, yeah. and uh, our director, Brandt, um, had some, some interface with the filmmakers at certain events and the BAFTAs uh, leading up to this, and they were very aware of our film as well. So it's kind of a mutual admiration society. The Cave is specifically about um, work in a hospital that is uh, right in the middle of the war zone, and it's it's a subterranean hospital. Like the the where they're doing the hospital work is all underground, even as bombs are falling above ground, and um, and people, you know, they're they're helping people, and they're they're trapped underground sometimes, and they can't go above without missiles falling, and sometimes you're running out of stuff that you need. It's mm. a hospital. We don't think of them as running out. But if you're in a war zone, you're going to start running out of of uh, alcohol. Yeah. You're going to start running out of bandages. bandages. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's just so hard. How do you run a hospital? How do you do the job uh, without just uh, completely giving up hope? Um, and the filmmakers are right in the middle of it. Uh, Faraz Fayyad, who already did this with Last Men in Aleppo, is so amazing uh, and so dedicated to these people, it's just my heart goes out to to all of them. It is, um, it's it's uh, it's a remarkable thing, and I think we all hope that this conflict ends sooner than than later. But um, what a wonderful film, and uh, what a noble effort. Oh, man, Syria, what a mess. Jeez, what I know, mess. continues uh, to be. The, the, the Montessori education, the Montessori mode of education, Maria Montessori, uh, 1907, established this method of teaching. It's a child-centered method of teaching that really allows the ch children to sort of uh, uh, progress at their own level, engage the things that they are interested in at the moment that they are interested in those things, and takes the teacher and pushes them to the background uh, as a figure uh, who is more or less guided guiding the children down paths at their own pace. And it's a very interesting sort of method of teaching. I know our, 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 our colleague, Greg Green, who writes with us over at uh, Synagogues, uh, his little girl, Angel, Montessori method, who's very particular about it. Uh, and, and, and you, are, are you guys doing Montessori over there? Is we it, are not. You, you're we not, are a public school family. Yeah, yeah but, but, even, but, but even that, the oh, Montessori method is starting to, in, to insinuate itself into so many kinds of schools. No, really? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, it's, okay. it's becoming the most uh, uh, prevalent method of teaching. And I, let me point out that uh, even in, in colleges and universities, it's starting to become a sort of, a, a sort of uh, a mode of teaching. I know that I've always leaned into it sort of with, uh, yeah, you, you know, by, by nature as a, a teacher in, in, in various different ways and on various different levels. Uh, and I've always found it to be a very effective mode of teaching. It's let the kids figure it out. And that's the name of this film, Montessori. Let the children be cool. the guide. Uh, so cool. interesting stuff there. Uh, so far as that is concerned. Um, uh, this, this, this doc here, 
cold case Hammers killed. Dag Hammarskjöld, 1961, uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General. So da- amazing. Da- on a plane, plane goes missing. Yeah. Uh, and, and never found. 50 years later, these journalists, these Danish journalists, they yeah. decide they're going to they go. Now, this plays like a thriller. This plays, it does. This plays better than most thrillers play. The, 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 the disappearance and death of Dag Hammer, Hammarskjöld, or Hammarskjöld, mm-hmm. how do you pronounce it? Um, really was something I, I was too young to uh, ever No, yeah, I was born in 1961, yeah. so no, yeah. So, but, it, so, but it was still a relevant thing all through the 70s. Yeah, it, it was, it was it, but, you know, I didn't even really know what the UN was until I was like 13. You know, it's like, oh, it's a thing? Okay. But but the, the um, what's what's so fascinating about this doc is, number one, it's it's made in a very weird way. Like, he, he keep, the, the filmmaker is in it, and he hires these succession of secretaries, mm. and there are these sort of, recreations and whatnot but what's interesting is that going to to unraveling what happened to Hammerschild winds up being the least of what he discovers exactly yeah it opens up this thing it goes sideways there are any number of false starts that go that that lead them down these tributaries where all kinds of interesting stuff is found none of which having to do with what happened to him no and then when you find out what happened to him, it opens up, oh, and by the way, there's this. And you go, whoa. <laughs> yeah. just, you're like, are you kidding me? And, and and I know if you're listening to me, you're thinking like, well, was he part of a sex cult? So much weirder. <laughs> so much more interesting more scary. than that. So much freakier. And, and it's the kind of thing I get. You know, narrative films are going to be you know, yeah. narrative films. But you know what? They, they, no. They, this, yeah. is the, this is the thing you want to watch. That's it. This movie right here. Also got uh, Liana, which uh, is a wonderful, wonderful foreign doc. Uh, that's on Blu-ray. And this thing has racked up awards all over the world. This is, um, uh, this is about orphan – this is an African doc about orphan children uh, that is done in I, – I don't even know how to describe the style. And it's totally worth your time. It's like under 80 minutes. It just – it comes by and it blows by. But um, it is uh, – this is about um, – um, a South African storyteller, a very famous South African storyteller, whose name I cannot pronounce, and I'm not even going to try. Yeah. But he takes um, a, a group of five children who've all been orphaned to create a new and original fairy tale. And the fairy tale that they create is the story of Liana. And then they create an animated film around this fairy tale. And it's beautiful. Uh, and it's uh, you know it's it's like it's it's kind of a documentary, but it's kind of not. It's sort of an animated film, but it's not. It's it's all of these things, and, and it's a really remarkable thing. But what it is ultimately, it's about stories. Mm. And we we take fairy tales and legends and the ancient stories for granted. We take uh, Beowulf for granted. Mm. We take the Mahabharata for granted. Mm. We take all whether whether they're religious stories or not, or you know legends all. We just take, you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey, we take all these things for granted without realizing what may have gone into them. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like revisiting that process. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really fascinating and it's beautiful and it's a wonderful film. Uh, It is Liana. And you can can learn more about it by going to uh, Liana Film, L-I-Y-A-N-A Film.com. I happen to have hosted uh, a screening of that for the International Documentary Association. Tandy Newton, who's the voice, and uh, happened to be there. Fantastic. Lovely film. Good stuff. Um, so do we want to, uh, do, f- let, let me, let me do some foreign. I'll yeah, hit do some the foreign, foreign and then I'll come back to TV. TV. Okay. Yeah. So got, uh, got a couple from Cohen who we love very much because, uh, Tim and I have been paid by them to do commentaries. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got, uh, uh, a new one and an old one. The contemporary classics line from Cohen Media Group is Brit Marie was here, which stars, the uh, very, very wonderful and always engaging um, uh, Pernilla August, who is the wife of Billy August. And they met, of course, Making the Best Intentions, which won the Cannes Film Festival in 1992, which was my first year there. And then they got married, and they're a lovely couple. And now Pernilla August, who played Ingmar Bergman's mother in that uh, Palme d'Or winning masterpiece, is now older. But she's still an absolutely delightful actress. And this is one of those... um, it's based on a novel by the same guy who wrote A Man Called Ove uh, from a few years ago, which was Oscar nominated. Um, so Pernilla August plays a, a, a housewife who's pretty much sick and tired of having been married to this bum for all these years and wasted her life. Mm-hmm. And she, she picks up and leaves. She just leaves the bastard. And um, now she, here she is in her you know, mid-60s. 
and she's starting her life all over again. And she winds up basically coaching a kid's soccer team mm -hmm. for these, you know, these like mostly immigrant and, and uh, um, uh, poor youths. And um, it's wonderful. It's a Swedish film. It's absolutely terrific. Now, yeah, it's totally one of those yes, movies. Yes, but those movies are always but those wonderful. those movies are always wonderful. And, um, you know, what the kids teach her and what she teaches them, she doesn't know anything about soccer. It's just <laughs> a thing she's trying to do because she's trying to reinvent her life. But, man, it's, it's just got so much heart, and it's just really, really sweet. Uh, and uh, I can't. I, I think they got a. It's a real gem. So uh, uh, Brit Marie was here. That's B R I T T hyphen M A R I. The uh, the French the classics of French cinema line from Cohen Film Collection uh, is the. They gave us the two part Jacques Rivette movie Joan the Maid, which is bloody amazing. The story of Joan of Arc has been told so many times. I am of the opinion this is the only time it's been done right. But Bear in mind, it's Jacques Rivette. It's long. Jacques Rivette made um, La Belle Noiseuse, which was theatrically released at four hours, not including intermission, which is an incredible film. I went and saw it in the theater, all four hours of it, and it's mind-boggling. But Jacques Rivette, one of the pioneers of the French New Wave, doesn't really care what you think about the length of his movies. He's old enough now. And he, you know. Anyway, this was made in 1993. Uh, and uh, he, he went to town. Sandrine Bonner, who uh, at the time was, you know, a few years after her uh, Saint-Trois Nidois uh, Vagabond uh, César win, uh, stars as Joan of Arc, and uh, they did a 4K restoration, transferred it to Blu-ray, and the total running time of the two films together is 336 minutes. No. So that's over five hours. I just want to underline it's over five hours for the whole thing make some time, but it is so worth it. It is so worth it because it really, really is the only one that, uh, that, that goes into um, uh, all of the, 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 the details of Joan of Arc. I mean, it really, really is an incredible film. It's just an incredible film. So good on Cohen for finally bringing that out because it was out previously and then disappeared. Uh, one of the more interesting Asian films from the last year was Long Day's Journey into Night, which was uh, a yeah. selection of certain regard. Long Day's Journey into Night uh, has just that uh, Justin is quoted on the back. Yeah, here, yeah by the way. our Justin Chang. Um, it's uh, the that the continuous camera thing, um, and you know it, it's I mean it's a, there's a one hour long sequence here that's mm. one continuous it's legit not like 1917 no 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 not it's that. legit yeah. it's legitimately one continuous uninterrupted hour long shot and uh it's pretty amazing um it is it, it the film was released in 3D but i would almost say that doesn't really do anything i'd rather watch it in 2D nonetheless um this is this is a super super successful film in china and it's um it's it's kind of a it's sort of a little bit like uh, In the Mood for Love. It's a little bit like some Wong Kar Wai stuff in, in his style and his approach. It's basically about a guy who's trying to, to find a woman that had you know, once disappeared, that he once knew. And um, it's a little bit of a, a quest and a romance, and it's poetic, and it's beautifully shot. And um, the, the, you know, the, the, the movie theater shot is really just amazing and wonderful and magical. Um, Yirga by Benjamin Gilmore. This is uh, also a kind of a big uh, festival hit over over time. This is um, uh, a, a an Afghan film mm -hmm. made primarily about the Afghan conflict, entirely in Pashto, and uh, feels very much because of its location. Obviously, very influenced by Iranian film, and um, it's about the. It's about tribal culture in Afghanistan. It sort of goes into, like, Yirga, what a Yirga is, is a, is a kind of a, a judicial ruling by uh, village elders in, in, the, in the traditional cultures of the Pashtun. And um, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's quite an amazing film. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it, goes to the, it goes to all of the, the cultural divides that make that conflict so incredibly difficult. And um, it's, uh, you know, the, it, 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 basically it's all kind of told from the point of view of an Australian soldier who um, uh, it feels as though he, oh, I don't want to reveal this, so mm -hmm. how do I put this? Mm -hmm. a sold, he, he has a reason for revisiting it. I won't tell you what his reason is. 
Um, but he he has to go back to Afghanistan to um, to um, play part in a year gap. That's all I'll tell you. Mm. I won't tell you anything else. It's, it's really important that all that kind of be a surprise. So um, anyway, there's that. And then the last two here, Battle of Stalingrad. Boy, the, by the way, as a detour, you see the trailer for, uh, for Greyhound, the Tom Hanks thing? Oh, no, not that you yet. wrote? No. So Tom Hanks optioned a book, I guess, wrote the screenplay himself. Uh, some guy directed it I've never heard of. But it's basically a story of a commander of a, of a ship during World War II and and when they were, I guess, surrounded by U-boats and whatnot. Big naval battle story. Mm-hmm. Never been told before. Tom mm-hmm. Hanks, of course, plays well, the take, captain of the yeah, ship. Yeah, Tom has that particular Looks World War II thing. Though. Yeah. Looks terrific, I mean, I mean, it's mostly CG, clearly, all mm. the battle stuff, but not in like a really annoying midway, midway yeah, Pearl so. Harbor way. Yeah. It looks like they really went to, to great lengths to make it not obviously CG and to not kind of go lowbrow. Mm, really it's impressive. Greyhound. Yeah, Greyhound. Anyway, on that note, uh, the Battle of Leningrad is, uh, is a very, very impressive uh, German-made film that uh, deals specifically with the Battle of Leningrad. And uh, this was made in 2019, or released in 2019, never got a theatrical release in the United States, but uh, it, it, it does a very good job of walking a middle line between melodrama and being uh, relatively accurate to the events in question that happened in uh, September 1941. Um, Battle of Leningrad is just an incredible piece of history, and uh, it's never been adequately treated on film. I think this is about eighty-five percent of uh, what it what it actually deserved. It's it's quite a good mm. film. Well done. And then, lastly, synonyms uh, by Nadav Lapid. Uh, this was a winner of the Golden Bear at uh, Berlin, and was kind of in the mix for a moment with our awards. A lot of people were naming this, and it didn't really kind of uh, make it out. But yeah. nonetheless, winning Berlin is not a slouchy thing. This is a really, really superb film. It is. Uh, it's 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 actually a, a very unusually funny movie uh, in ways that you simply wouldn't necessarily expect. It it, it stars Tom Mercier. Did Tom Mercier get some love in our voting? I yeah, yeah, he we did. he got he got some votes. I don't know if, I don't know that he won, but yes, he was at the top of the the, the really folks good. we were talking about in this movie. Well, very he, droll he is. Very droll, really talented. I'd love to see him. I hope he can speak English because he would just be terrific uh, in some films here too. Anyway, he plays a, this Israeli guy who wants to start a new life, and he goes to Paris. And uh, the problem here is that he's he he. Well, not so much a problem, but he resolves that he's not going to speak Hebrew. He's only going to speak French using his dictionary. Mm-hmm. So he's gonna. It's like being plunged into the into the fire. He's just gonna. He's gonna sink or swim as far as the language is concerned. And um, the script is so so clever and funny, and um, it's based on uh, Nadav Lapid's own experience. He directed the kindergarten teacher previously. Mm-hmm. It's based on his own experience, and it's and it feels very. But it just doesn't. It, the, the the way that uses language and situations and timing is very very clever and very smart and wonderful music to boot. So synonyms, winner of the Golden Bear on Blu-ray. Uh, the point of the title being that there aren't any. <laughs> yes, between exactly. languages, don't yeah. look for them. There is they, they, there is no equivalent yeah. uh, between uh, any, well any languages really. I got a few TV thingies yeah. here, kind of an odd mishmash of things here, beginning with. Um, uh, Ultraman, Return of Ultraman, the original, well, not the original, but the, the second series, 1971 to 1972, uh, which marks, as it says, the return of Ultraman. But uh, in, in fact, this is a different Ultraman because if you know what happens at the end of the first series, you know it has to be a different Ultraman. Yeah. Uh, but he's from the same nebula, Nebula M78, uh, and apparently all the creatures in this nebula more or less look the same and wear the same suit. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And, and have the same fighting style. Uh, it, 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 this one is kind of cool, though. Uh, it's it's updated, uh, you know, for the for the early seventies with all kinds of new creatures uh, for Ultraman to have to fight. Uh, and a car, a speed racer, had become something of a thing by then. So um, our our co-character, who's running around, Heidi Go, is a is a race car driver in this series, and it's really wicked cool, and I and I just absolutely love it. Uh, the return of Ultraman. The suit is a little bit cleaner and slicker, and uh, and Ultraman can move a little bit better yeah. uh, in this series uh, than he could in the original series, which is uh, <laughs> uh, kind of needle torpedo. Uh, you got to let me borrow that one for sure. Yeah. And it brings us, of course, to uh, a two film set. 
um, Ultraman Orb, uh, Origins of Ultraman, and uh, Ultraman Fight. Now, Ultraman Orb, Origin Saga, is actually a sequel to Ultraman Fight Orb. This, these are live action films. And they're both uh, films set in the world of Ultraman. The second one, the or, or, Origin Saga, is 12 episodes. And it, uh, it, it, it brings us into the notion of where the Ultraman characters come from. You got to love it. Uh, a lot of familiar characters here, along with some new characters that Ultraman has to find. And again, you got to let me borrow these, dude. This is these <laughs> stuff like this is like time machines for I me. Know. It's just, I know. It's just, pure time travel uh yeah, 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 hanging out with that stuff two or three times a week ancient aliens season 12 man if you had asked me 12 years ago or however long uh that this thing would last for 12 seasons uh yeah i, I don't know i don't even know what to say about that on the history channel this is volume two uh, and it takes us to all kinds of wacky places, uh, looking at geoglyphs uh, on Mars that aren't geoglyphs at all. At all. They're just mountainous ranges. Uh, yeah, yeah, theorists explain uh, extraterrestrial contacts around the world, but they don't really because there haven't been any. Um, um, uh, African remote viewing uh, of uh, yeah, yeah, UFO targeting operations, which also don't actually exist. Nevertheless, all of that, this stuff is discovered in the 12 episodes of... Um, and you know what, what drives me crazy about this series is that it's executive produced by Kevin Burns. Yeah. Uh, who's, you know. Ken uh, Burns' brother. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, dude, you're just killing, you're killing the whole family thing here. Yeah. Uh, with this goofy, uh, uh, goofy crap. Ancient Aliens season 12. And then the television series, the complete series of The Affair, which began in 2014. And I think, was, if I'm not mistaken, it was adapted from an Australian se series, but I'll have to check myself on that. And it's this really powerful, dramatic se series, ran for five seasons, about um, an affair had by a couple in this small town and how that aff affair affects everything in both of their families' lives over the course of the next several years. Wow. And it's a really, really, really well-done series. It's not particularly hyperbolic. It's not about... And there, there's, there's a little crime mystery uh, that, that, that sort of uh, works its way through the narrative as well. Uh, but Murrah Tarrany in it, Joshua Jackson in it, uh, a really, really neat, um, uh, powerful series. All kinds of special, theories, uh, special features on this set for you to partake in. Um, and, you know, if you like... Um, if you like really good dramas, The Affair is definitely one. Complete series. Uh, a few more foreign films here. Some really, really good stuff. So, uh, An Elephant Sitting Still, one of the more interesting Chinese films from last year. Uh, this is by a filmmaker named Hu Bo. This was also in our awards mix. Yeah. And uh, we were on a marathon to obviously see everything. And then everybody was like, I said, should I see Elephant Sitting Still? And everybody was telling me like, oh, yeah, you should definitely see Elephant Sitting Still. But but you do you know it's four hours right <laughs> yeah. and and I said yeah it's not gonna make the cut uh, I can Man. watch I can watch three other movies in that in that four hour period I got I got to start checking things off I yeah. know a four hour Chinese movie is not gonna be in the running for any major awards no, no it just isn't not enough people will have seen it but it is interesting what's funny is the quote that they they chose to to print on this uh, and this is from um, who did release this remember who released this but anyway uh it looks like it's ready re, uh, redience red, red, red oh kim stim this is kim stim release ah. um so the quote they choose to go with is a bellatar quote now bellatar for those who don't necessarily know is the hungarian filmmaker who is primarily renowned for making very slow long yeah. boring movies yeah. that's what he does <laughs> bellatar mm. movies take forever and bellatar mm. bellatar this is funny he says this movie will be with us forever <laughs> <laughs> now, now, on the uh, uh, my first reaction was, "Damn, for a guy who makes movies as long as yours, what he means is this movie's gonna be with us forever. It never ends. It's yeah. still going on. I started watching it. It's still with us. <laughs> um, it's four hours long. It's Damnation. basically a very brooding drama about the toll of Chinese economic development on the people who are left behind. Yeah, and uh, it goes into a mythical place. The title comes from this." Very particular mythical place in China, where presumably there's an elephant that uh, that you know a, 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 a kind of mystical elephant that uh, um, doesn't move. Anyway, an elephant sitting still is a an interesting film, but man, you got to have the four hours to dedicate to it. Olivia is a really amazing thing. Icarus Films and Distrib Films have released this. Uh, this is incredible. Jacqueline Audry was one of the first significant French female filmmakers. Um, she made this in 1950, 
They restored it a couple of years ago. It's totally unknown to a certain generation. I didn't know this movie even existed. It is a fascinating all-female cast. It's about basically the politics of a girl's boarding school and the horrors that go on inside and the clashes and the and the conflicts and whatnot and um, and what happens. And it's really, really interesting. Uh, it's really well done. It's very polished. I know nothing about Jacqueline Audrey. Mm. She's interviewed here. There's a rare 1957 interview with her. And uh, I, I now I'm suddenly fascinated by this woman's career that I've never heard of before. So it's called Olivia, and it's on Blu-ray from Icarus Films and Distrib Films. And then there's also uh, Give Me Liberty, which was also at Cannes and Sundance, uh, which is fun. Not exactly a fish-out-of-water movie, but it's basically about this guy in Milwaukee. He's a medical transport driver, and then he has to kind of detour his normal driving chores to drive his grandfather, his Russian grandfather, and a bunch of other Russians to a funeral. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a fish-out-of-bus uh, or something. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's funny, it's sweet, it's frenetic. It's unpredictable. It's a little slapsticky. It's touching. It's humanistic. It kind of does all those things, and uh, it's, it's a it's a good solid little movie. Give me liberty from Music Box Films, and then the last one here is uh, from Screen Media. It is Lose, which is a one of the very rare uh, genre films that we sometimes get from uh, uh, certain overseas markets. This is a a, a German Spanish co production. And uh, this is from Screen Media and Altered Innocence. You can get more on them from alteredinnocence.net. But the um, it's a it's about a cab driver who uh, has just barely escaped from a woman who is completely and totally possessed, presumably. And um, it's uh, it was it it, it it takes some very unorthodox twists and turns. A couple of them I thought I saw coming. Some of the others I didn't. Not sure if they completely work. But anyway, uh, it's uh, it it's I think it's trying to do a little bit of what uh, who are those guys that do all the uh, Blumhouse? Oh yeah, trying to be a little bit German Blumhouse in style. It was shot in sixteen. You know, it's trying to really go for a little bit of a gritty thing, a certain gritty fear. F- movies that are a little too polished aren't quite as scary as as, as others. So, um, you know, it has it has a little kind of a an exploitation feel to it, like a, like the Euro schlock era is is a little bit in its DNA as well. Um, it's worth checking out. It's called Lose if you like that kind of if you like that genre, if you like the European approach to uh, supernatural horror mm. and suspense. It's worth checking out. Shall I knock off a couple over yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. do a few of these. These are uh, well, just movies, uh, uh, not not classics, classic, classic movies, yeah. and including this one, an actual classic called "The Point." This is an animation with songs written and sung by Harry Nilsson, uh, although narrated by Ringo Starr. This is from 1972. This wonderful animation is uh, from the, the the Academy Award winning animator Fred Wolf, whom most folks will know. Mostly because of the Flintstones. Oh, Fred Wolf was the animator of the Flintstones, nice. among uh, yeah, yeah, a great many other uh, uh, sort of television cartoons from that period. This was this sort of fantastically uh, wonderful uh, uh, notion here about this place called Pointland, where everything has a point. All the buildings, all the cars, everything has a point, except for one little boy called Oblio. Who does not have a pointed head? He has a rounded head. This is a wonderful, <coughs> this is a wonderful film. It's very, very charming. The little boy, the voice of the little boy, is Mike Lookland from the old Brady Bunch series uh, in 1972. So he would be about the age that he was when he was playing Bobby Brady uh, on the Brady Bunch. Uh, uh, this little boy, and it's just a, a wonderfully done. Film. This is a 2K restoration, high definition transfer from the 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter elements, and it's really, really just wonderful. All kinds of special features on here, including lots and lots of interviews from people who were involved in lots of animation and neat stuff uh, from back in the day. And it's a great story with some really wicked animation. A little Mike Lookland, Bobby Brady, gotta love that. Uh, Mind Games, Bob Yari. Bob Yari is known more as a as, a as a producer. Yeah, uh, but he did direct two films, including this one. Uh, and another one of them called Papa Hemingway a couple of years ago. But Mind Games, way back in the 1980s, uh, Maxwell Caulfield, uh, Edward Albert film. It's one of those films about a guy who takes his family on a trip up to Northern California, wherever they're going. They pick up a hitchhiker. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, played by Maxwell Caulfield, who's a psychology student. <laughs> and you know what that means. He's going to play mind games, hack and slash film. Uh, but like I said, Bob, uh, better known as a producer of uh, Academy Award winning things like Crash, Yeah, I think is one of his. Um, uh, but you know, this is an okay mystery thriller, uh, part of the Rewind collection from MVD. Uh, Wild America. Jonathan Taylor Thomas. I can remember when he was on that sitcom. Uh, what was it? Tool Time? I, it was, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He was one of the little guys on that sitcom. That's right. And I always thought he was going to use a handsome kid. I thought he was going to grow up to be Home a big movie star. Yeah. Home Improvement. Yeah. yeah. Home Improvement. That was the name. Home of. Improvement. Uh, but you know, I don't Tim know. Allen. Although he did make this neat little movie. Um, this is just an adventure story about these three brothers who drive around the country, uh, shooting in endangered wildlife. Uh, they go on an adventure. Something happens along the way, and they have to. They have to engage in their own self-reliance uh, and bravery to pull themselves out of a bit of a pickle. Um, you, you know, this was a neat movie at the time. I remember people liked it a lot. William Deere film of this one. Not bad. Um, Angel Eyes. This, 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 uh, to, Jennifer Lopez had that run of movies uh, where she more or less played some sort of a character, uh, you know, some sort of a, uh, uh, well, there you go, Made in Manhattan. That, <laughs> Which I'm going to talk about in just a second. And, 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 and for a moment, she stepped out of that to play this cop in this movie called Angel Eyes. I think Angel Eyes is one of her best performances. It's one of her best performances. Yeah. It's a straight up through Jim Caviezel in the movie. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nice thriller. Uh, and she get, it really opens with a very intense uh, sequence. It is uh, there, and it's just a, you know. But you know, it wasn't one of those movies. It's a super underrated movie, and that image on the cover of the Blu-ray, yeah, I think is the reason it didn't do better because it wasn't Jennifer Lopez. It wasn't clearly Jennifer Lopez's face. face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be mm, interesting. That's why interesting little movie. You want to take a couple? Yeah. So as long as we're on the Jennifer Lopez train, uh, I'll jump right to Made in Manhattan, which is just a straight up romantic comedy with uh, Ray Fiennes. It's it's. It's basically My Fair Lady or Pygmalion. She's a maid and she winds or or or, or uh, a pretty woman. Yeah. You know, it's basically that. She plays a maid and then of course she winds up, you know, landing Ray Fines and and you know, it's a it's a princess story. No, oh, and she she's literally made that movie 15 times. She's made this movie over and over and over. And look, I'm sorry. I I'll be honest. The movie loses credibility the moment that you see Jennifer Lopez as a maid. <laughs> as a face, like no, you just you can't disappear into that role no matter uh, how good you are. Yeah, she no. can disappear as a stripper. Oh or yeah, as a pole dancer. Oh yeah, but as a maid, no, no, that doesn't no. work. That's like that's like Barbara Streisand in the mirror has two faces. <laughs> yeah, she's Babs from the second that movie starts. Yeah, it's like no, and then and then like midway through the movie, there's that shot of uh, going up the, the the mirror, and there she is. And Barbara has now officially gone to wardrobe, <laughs> and she's now Barbara. She's like. Uh, uh, she is who you always uh, come on stop it like you, you there are certain things that stretch credibility um gracie's choice only on dvd only on dvd has a very young Kristen bell in it along with diane ladd and Anne Heche. and uh, you, you forget how good Kristen bell really can be as an actress uh she's very very young in this this was made in 2004 uh 16 years ago mm. 16 years ago um, but anyway, it's, a, it's effectively a, a family drama. Uh, she's a young girl. She's had a you know a drug addict for a mom. She's uh, kind of had to raise herself, and now she's seventeen, and uh, she's got to basically be there for her younger siblings, where her mom wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Um, and Hayesh plays her mom. Diane Ladd plays the grandma. And they're a really great trio, uh, and it's and it's a good solid. It's a solid little movie that most people probably haven't heard of. Mm. Everything else here from uh, Mill Creek. Those are both from Mill Creek. Everything else here. These are Mill Creek double features. Um, the, the first one here is on DVD only, not Blu-ray. It's a couple of uh, Native American themed stories, The Pathfinder and The Song of Hiawatha. Neither of them very good. Uh, I mean, I, The Pathfinder is based on a James Fenimore Cooper story. Could could and should have been better. It's got Russell Means and Graham Greene in it, kind of uh, holding it down. Kevin Dillon and Stacey Keach don't necessarily. Song of Hiawatha is a little bit better. Graham Greene's in that as well, uh, along with Russell Means again and David Strathern, Michael Rooker. Um, you know, bottom line, these are Graham Greene movies, or mm. yeah, that's it. That they're they're his movies to kind of make or break, and he doesn't have a whole lot working with him going along. Uh, double feature of Dad and I'm Not Rappaport. Uh, all about people growing older. Uh, Jack Lemmon and uh, and uh, Ted Danson with, and Ethan Hawke play the three generations in Dad. It's a very sweet, you know, affecting movie. 
Uh, didn't it, Gary David Goldberg uh, wrote and directed it? Who, of course, created yeah. Family Ties, yeah. and it's a, it's you know it was his attempt to kind of take his his pathos into theaters, and it didn't quite pan out. But it's 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 better than people give it credit for. And I'm not Rappaport uh, is a very theatrical adaptation of what's basically a two person play. Um, it's, yeah, it's fine. Walter Matthau and Ossie Davis uh, are good, but they're basically doing what they did on stage. So I mean, it you know it, it doesn't give you much more than that. Uh, Reservation Road and Return to Paradise, not really my thing. This is kind of you know millennial thrillers. Uh, Vince Vaughn and Haitian Joaquin Phoenix and Return to Paradise. And Joaquin Phoenix, Mark Ruffalo, Jennifer Connelly, and Mira Sorvino in Reservation Road. Um, Both are of a certain type of film that was a thing in the 1990s primarily. Um, You know, thrillers that are very kind of human thrillers and trying to be thriller and drama at the same time. I mean, they're okay. They have uh, decent casts. Uh, I I just don't think that the two movies have lasted very well. Terry Pratchett is an author who writes kind of... um, fantasy novels and they they made two adaptations of them the color of magic and hog father neither of which i have ever heard of neither of which is very good to be honest and uh, those are on a double feature here as well see them only if you want to see uh certain cast members in them um you know uh, tim curry is is fine in the color of magic but uh, otherwise there's not a whole lot going for it it's kind of like second tier uh harry potter Few over here. Yeah, uh, American Outlaws. This is a uh, 2001 film. Uh, it's basically a cowboy movie with Jesse James at the center of it. Though the way it shapes itself is, is sort of interesting. Most interesting about this film is, who, is who's all in it. Back in 2001, you got Colin Farrell playing Jesse James, Scott Kahn, Ali Lauder, Gabriel Mock. You got Harris Yulin in this film. You got Kathy Bates in this film. Timothy Dalton's in the film. Uh, Terry O'Quinn. Uh, who people will know from Lost and other things. So, you know, a whole bunch of folks in this uh, interesting sort of uh, cowboy movie. In in and of itself, it's about the railroad roads coming in, uh, the corrupt uh, railroad magnets buying up all this land, mostly this rancher land, illegally uh, coming by these deeds and then these sort of young rancher guys, which is what uh, Jesse James and his family had been, and his brothers, they had been ranchers. And And in fact, their ranch was stolen, uh, by a b- bunch of dirty railroad guys, and that did, in fact, uh, set them off on what began a long uh, crime spree that involved robbing a whole lot of banks uh, until Jesse got himself shot. This is this has all kinds of deleted scenes in it. What's interesting is just to watch all these actors way back in the day, you know, young Colin Farrell. Oh, uh, man, yeah, I do yeah, remember that. Not long after Tigerland, he, this would have been. He's starting to age a little bit, but yeah. really slowly. They're very, very slow, yeah. I, yeah. Which is unusual because, you know, those Irish genes and alcohol and everything else that, yeah. that, that, that goes on up there, you, you tend to run into people who look like they're about 80, <laughs> and they've just turned 25. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm part Irish. I can say that. Yeah, oh boy, so, oh, boy, oh, boy. So um, really interesting thing has just come out from Kino Lorber. It's called uh, – it's a box set, Forbidden Fruit, the Golden Age of the Exploitation Picture, which we are very connected to because this is also the mm-hmm. 20th anniversary of our documentary, Schlock, The Secret mm-hmm. History of American mm-hmm. Movies. And we talk about some of this in there. Mom and Dad was a seminal movie – as far as exploitation films go, uh, this is volume one of the set, and uh, this movie was banned for 11 years, believe it or not. It's actually now in the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress, but it is, it's one of those, um, uh, it ba- it's basically a cautionary, you know, the, the public health movies. This is all about venereal disease and, uh, and everything else that goes along with being sexually promiscuous. It's funny, it's shocking, it's, uh, it's all those things, and it was made by... Kroger Bab, who we talk about in Schlock as one of the sort of seminal figures in creation of the uh, the um, the exploitation film. So anyway, this was made in 1945, literally right at the beginning of that era. Post-war era is when all this stuff starts and really just blows up in the 1960s. But the uh, as far as the sex hygiene films, this is where it really all begins. The next one here is, of course, Reefer Madness, which ah. they include along with Sex Madness. Same thing. Uh, Reefer Madness needs no introduction. This is from the Something Weird Library, who we know them very, very well. And um, it, 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 Reefer Madness has been made into a musical, which is how we actually start our uh, schlock documentary. So uh, this feels like a supplementary set to, to ours, and uh, I think it's pretty great. Reefer Madness and Sex Madness, still very fun. 
And then uh, the last one gets into the nudism films, which... Uh, oh, the nudie cuties. The nudie cuties and the nudist camp movies. And uh, this one is called um, uh, Unashamed, and they include it with Elysia, Valley of the Nude. Now, Unashamed is billed as a romance. It's like, well, that's a good thing. Because uh, it's naked people. It'd be terrible if there weren't some romance going on. Uh, and they, they, they also say actually filmed in a nudist camp because that was such a shocking thing at the time. Right? It's, you know, 1930s and that these things actually existed. I mean, wow, how strange. Uh, anyway, 1938, Unashamed, A Romance. And Elysia Vallis, Valley of the Nude, 1933. Keep in mind... Nudist camp movies don't really take off until the 1950s, so this is more than a decade, almost two decades, ahead of the curve, and uh, it's it's actually shockingly well photographed for a couple of very early exploitation films, fringe films, also from the Something Weird Library, with uh, a great audio commentary from Alexander Helen Nicholas on Unashamed, and uh, a 1937 short called Nudist Land, a 1933 short called Why Nudism, mm. and uh, a, a really fun little five-minute uh, ditty called Hollywood Script Girl from 1938. A few over here uh, from, 19, from 1994. I remember, uh, I think I covered the junket for this movie, if I'm not mistaken. I certainly remember interviewing the perfectly beautiful Joanne Whaley at the time. Eventually became Joanne Whaley Kilmer, Val Kilmer's I think maybe first wife. I think so. I if think I'm you're not right. mistaken. Yeah. Uh, Armand Asante, Gabriel Byrne in this film, and William Hurt. This is a film about a young woman uh, who uh, is picked up to sit on a, a, a jury trial of a mob boss who uh, committed murder and uh, is threatening, unbeknownst to everyone else, her son. Uh, and it's about it's about what she's going to do. Uh, particularly to save her son. The, uh, they made a lot of thrillers like this back in the day. They were all really, really good. Uh, they don't really make these anymore. These are these are television or streaming movies now. Um, uh, back in the day, the, this these this was feature film material uh, directed by Haywood Gould, Woody Gould, uh, a director friend of mine, who so I've known for quite a long time. Um, Victory, 1981, Sylvester Stallone film. Uh, a film with Sylvester Stallone in it anyway. So uh, Michael Caine, uh, uh, the great Pele in this film, directed by John Huston. So this is a film uh, that at the core of it uh, has these two teams playing, uh, the, the Aryan sort of Nazi team playing to prove Aryan superiority as they do, and then a sort of hodgepodge of Americans and Brits and Brazilians and whatnot playing on the Allied team. Uh, what's neat about this movie is that while the whole sort of who's better, the uh, the the soccer players is at play. What they're really doing is planning an escape, and it's a hell of a movie. Besides, the great Pele is in this movie. I, I still, I'm still a real apologist for this movie. John Huston, Pele, I'm done. Yeah, I'm you know, I, the, the rest of it, whatever the hell. Yeah. Football. Um, Tex Avery. Oh, dang. love this collection. Uh, Screwball Classics Volume One. Gotta love Tex. Uh, 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 Tex gave us uh, Droopy uh, Dog. Droopy Dog, and he he simply he simply gave us a different sort of cartoon. Uh, animation different than what Walt was doing on the other side of town. Uh, you know, different big, from Warner Brothers. Different from what the Warner Brother guys yeah. were doing on the other side of town. He, he just, you know, it was just a different sort of thing that he I, gave us. When he I, was I, funny. Eyeballs, eyeballs that pop, pop out, out of your, your head. head. Yeah, he was just being funny. Was he was being thing. goofy. Uh, and uh, and this is a really really wonderful dog. It includes all kinds of stuff. Many of the Red Hot Riding Hood and all that kind of stuff. Very very saucy. Hex could be fantastic. Occasionally, stuff. great stuff. I uh, love this Lawrence Olivier movie from 1979, A Little Romance. I have a story about this. Mm. So uh, I hated Little Romance for a long time, mm. and I'll tell you why. Because uh, the that was one of the first Academy Awards that I actually felt very invested in, because Star Trek: The Motion Picture was up for three awards: ah. special effects, art and set direction, and Jerry Goldsmith's score. Mm. Um, it it uh, it wound up losing all three. Uh, Ike was convinced that it should have won all three. There was no question it was going to win them because what did I know at the time? Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, when it came to score, I loved that. I've listened to that score by that point maybe 150 times. And uh, they announced, and the winner of best original score is a little romance, uh, George Delarue. George Delarue. And I sat there and I cursed at the top of my lungs. Who the hell is this <laughs> George Delarue that beat Jerry Goldsmith? J Jerry Goldsmith. Uh, and of course, you know, within uh, about a year, I discovered that George Delarue is in fact. 
George Della Rue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Academy Award. Yeah. 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 Hey, this was a lovely film. Oh, yeah, an older Laurence Olivier. Yeah. Very, 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 very young Diane Lane. Oh, it's so good. Uh, you know, it, it, this beautiful little romance uh, going on him as he sort of uh, you know, ushers them together uh, on their little thing. It's just the cutest little thing. Uh, George Roy Hill film. Um, special features, uh, remembering romance with Diane Lane. Diane Lane uh, reflecting on this Wonderful. on this perfectly lovely little movie. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic indeed. Oh, my phone is ringing someplace. Uh, here, but I think I just smacked it off. Uh, 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 a Bell Book and Candle, James oh. Stewart, Kim Novak, and another charming film, the kind of film that you really can't make today. Kim mm. Novak is this rich one of one of the films that inspired Bewitched. Bewitched, the yeah, Bewitched. By yeah, the way. Bewitched, yeah. Uh, bothered and bewildered. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, an ordinary guy. Yeah. She's a witch. She can't fall in love. She puts a spell on him. He has yeah. his fiance, and she brings, and she realizes it's just the sweetest movie. They basically took this and then My Wife the Witch mm. and combined them into. Um, uh, uh, the TV series Bewitched. It was great. Um, got a got a couple of uh, uh, ah, it's all good. So we've got a couple of Robert Altman films here. Uh, one good and one not so good, and it's fascinating. You get the range of Robert Altman's career here, but probably both worth checking a look uh, checking out. So Beyond Therapy, which has an amazing cast, but it's just everything that that Robert Altman does not do well, mm. is uh, is, is kind of a good example. This is from 1987, and uh, look at this: uh, Jeff Goldblum, Tom Conti, Christopher Guest, Jen, Glenda Jackson, and Julie Haggerty in Beyond Therapy, which is just not funny. Jeff Goldblum is this. Um, is this kind of uh, neurotic guy in New York, and uh, he winds up um, meeting people through personal ads, and then everything goes into this ridiculous satire of of therapy and dating, and and it it's like you know it's like the Bob Newhart show except longer and less funny, and mm. uh, it just it, it doesn't really work at all. But it's interesting because you can see Altman being very Altman with something that doesn't lend itself to it. And you know what? He, he was at least taking a chance. On the other hand, you have Arrow Academy's release of Kansas City, which is, I think, one of Altman's most underrated movies. Uh, this was made in 1995. Yeah. And it is uh, basically um, a, it's a, it's a gangster film set during the Depression, and yeah. it looks at Kansas City and what kind, you know how it was. It Particularly just, the Kansas a, City jazz scene. The, a snapshot of a moment in time when Kansas City was, and we've talked about this. Kansas yeah. City and St. Louis are kind of yeah. as, as important musically as New Orleans. As New Orleans, particularly with the, when it comes to jazz, right up through Chicago. Yeah. And so Harry Belafonte, just yeah, great in that movie. Oh, it's, it's it's I mean this is just a great film. I mean Harry Belafonte, Miranda Richardson, Jennifer Jason Lee. Dermot Mulroney, Steve Buscemi. It's a typically great Altman cast, but it's uh, it, it, it is a very very it's a beautifully rendered film, beautiful art and art uh, art direction and uh, production design, well photographed, lots of great extras on here. Uh, Two thousand and seven visual essay by a French film critic um, who also does introductions to the film has the original Robert Altman commentary that he he recorded. Thank goodness before he passed. And uh, it's just wonderful. It has, you know, all the EPK press kits that were originally distributed with it. It's a great film, and I'm glad Arrow Academy <laughs> discovered it. So um, I would recommend you watch both Beyond Therapy and Kansas City if you are an Altman completist. But um, this is pretty great. And the unrated producer's cut of Hot Dog the Movie. I actually remember going to see this movie with my wife way to hell back in 1984. <laughs> and I can very re uh, much remember uh, what it felt like when she smacked me. Uh, for taking her to see this stupid movie, <laughs> you in know, one, uh, 1984. Uh, my, my one of my um, wife's childhood friends, uh, her father was a producer, a financier in this or something. Anyway, this was like my wife's first R-rated movie when she was a kid or something. It is just the wackiest thing. Guys go, they, they go screen. For some reason, there's like topless women. Uh, all the over this point. movie. It's, it's the whole it's the and, entire it's point of this movie. Skiing and titillation. It's what they did in the 80s. Yeah, nevertheless, special features. Uh, this is a brand new 4K restoration, all kinds of special features, audio commentary uh, with the uh, writer and co producer, Mike Marvin. Uh, it's one of those goofy movies from back in the day, like Porky's and two or three others from that early 80s yeah. period when. Uh, 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 joysticks. Joysticks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Anyway. Going all the way with Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, I really love that movie. Uh, 
uh, American Pie presents Band Camp Unrated, uh, another of the many lingering American Pie movies. The only person from the Ameri- from the original American Pie uh, films that's in this is Eugene Levy. Because uh, <laughs> every- sad, right? Everybody else is like forty five years old. Uh, and Eugene Levy still walked around these movies. Whatever. Uh, kind of goofy and silly. All kinds of bonus features, outtakes, deleted scenes, American uh, American Pie band camp. Uh, a funny joke, if you actually remember the original American uh, Pie film. Uh, an original film. You know, look, I got to tell you, this movie, at the time, I did the junket for this movie, Clueless, Alicia Silverstone's film. Uh, and it was just this absolutely charming Valley G- Girl spoof movie about this young girl who talked this sort of certain way at this school. You got Paul Rudd in this movie. This is this was just an absolutely charming movie uh, when it came out. I, I, I think it's like 1995 or something like that. And Alicia Silverstone went on to have a career for a while there. Uh, a lot of other folks worked all over television for many, many years coming out of this movie. And I just, I remember it as a perfectly charming, very, very funny uh, movie. Clueless, Alicia Stills on 1995. We have got uh, a bunch of great stuff to wrap out with now. I'm going to start with the one that's most obviously going to be for, uh, for, for Easter and Passover. Everybody loves to watch the Ten Commandments. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, you know it's Easter when the Ten Commandments. It's is on. been out before. You don't necessarily need to upgrade. However, this is nice. It's got both the 1923 and the 1956 films in here. The original uh, Cecil B. DeMille um, uh, silent, and then his 1956 remake, which, by the way, is still one of the most ten most successful films of all time in terms of tickets sold. Mm. And uh, it is also the only film, this is interesting, if you look at the top, in terms of adjusted for inflation, like the top 20 films of all time, mm-hmm. there's only one of them directed by somebody who's over 50. Uh-huh. This one. That one? That's the only one. Once you're over 50, you don't direct it, blockbusters anymore. It goes anymore. downhill. Huh? It goes downhill. Because I, I would have thought John Houston would be on that list, but I guess not. No. Plainly not. So anyway, uh, this is a new set. It's got a little collectible booklet. It's got, you know, it's a digipack case, so it's a little fragile, but it's uh, it's fine. It's a nice little booklet in it, and uh, the features, it's got some extra features for both uh, the 1923 and the 56 films. The original newsreel of the, of the uh, premiere in New York for the 1956 film is is fun, but ultimately it's it's the Blu-ray of the Ten Commandments. You're you're watching it to watch Charlton Heston do his, you know, his shtick. And, yeah, you and his thing, and uh, and Yul Brynner just being so so amazing in it. And then from Film Movement Classics, uh, a, two films from Alexander McKendrick, oh, the, the yeah. amazing Alexander McKendrick, uh, who when he was working at Ealing Studios, almost all of his stuff was for Ealing Studios um, in the 1940s and 50s, and uh, the films are Whiskey Galore and uh, The Maggie. Uh, Whiskey Galore is one I was not overly familiar with, but it is really, really great. I mean, it's amazing. It's um, it's a it's a it's about a uh, a Scottish island where they just yeah. they can't get access to whiskey, and yeah. <laughs> it's it's real. I mean, it's a very simple idea, and it's just taken to the out, outrageous extreme. And uh, Maggie is is also incredibly incredibly funny, um, which is uh, about this this boat captain. Um, here's the thing, Alexander McKendrick, and you get some good extras on here. There's an audio commentary for uh, Whiskey Galore, a documentary, uh, a featurette, and then a great booklet. But what you should do to really appreciate Alexander McKendrick mm-hmm. is watch Sweet Smell of Success on Thank the Criterion you. Channel. Thank you. Or get the Blu-ray. Yeah. Because I just did that three days ago. And they, the, the, uh, it's interesting because he taught out here, McKendrick did, at Art Center. And um, uh, one of his uh, one of his students at the time was James Mangold, mm-hmm. recently the Oscar nominated director or the director of the Oscar nominated Ford versus Ferrari and, and many other fine things. And Mangold goes into great detail about McKendrick's who who had like all of these aphorisms of what you do and don't do and how you create drama and how you don't like these laundry list of rules that were tacked all over the classroom. And when you when you you realize when you watch that featurette and then you watch Sweet Smell of Success as amazingly staged as it, as it is, and then you go back and you watch a film like this, this is a comedy. You don't realize how much craft mm-hmm. goes into it. Mm-hmm. But Kendrick was an amazing craftsman, and if you pay attention to his staging, his camera work, and everything else, it's just it's it's miraculous, just absolutely miraculous. And uh, then we've also got Masked and Anonymous from Shout Select, which has kind of disappeared a little bit from the radar. This had a a tremendous cast in it at the time. Uh, This is 2003, not that long ago. Uh, Jeff Bridges and Luke Wilson and Jessica Lange, John Goodman, Bob Dylan, Penelope Cruz, 
And uh, this movie just kind of evaporated. Mm. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting kind of Sundancey drama from the era, and uh, it, you know, it there were a number of these movies that kind of tried to take a lot of try to look at a particular aspect of Americana from the side, from a vantage, and you know what is where we're sort of fraying as a society around the edges, yeah. and and this is one of those, yeah. and. Um, it's uh, it, Bob Dylan kind of sort of plays himself. Uh, he's a you know he's this traveling musician who, uh, who who's who's about to be sort of the headliner of this very unwise uh, particular uh, benefit concert, and from there everything kind of goes in a little bit Altmanesque uh, direction. Doesn't quite work. Larry Charles uh, directed it, uh, does a commentary. Some very interesting interesting stuff in it. Really good performances doesn't entirely hang together good making of featurette but it's it's worth it's worth watching just the same and then we're going to go out with this amazing criterion release of uh one of the most legendary documentaries of all time it is an absolute essential film to have in any library whether or not you like documentaries or not from 1969 the Maisley's brothers uh and charlotte swearin made salesman which as far as i'm concerned changed the landscape for documentary filmmaking absolutely uh, it is sort of, it is like the original direct cinema uh, documentary of a certain type. It's completely restored with a 4K digital transfer, uh, and uh, the, you know Bill Hader talks about it on there. He's a big fan of it. Um, we it, follow a door to door salesman. Salesman. That's it. That's all we do. For one thing, there were door to door salesmen. I, I, I remember them. I remember them too. You were old enough to remember them. Yeah, actual so you vacuum cleaners, world book encyclopedias. That's, it. that's where we bought our world book. From. That's how we got our world book. Yeah. Door to door salesman sold yeah. them. It's an amazing film because it's not just about salesmen. It's not all of us. It's yeah. about the salesmen in all of us. And, and, and of course, this is at a moment when that is fading away. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we're actually watching uh, is that this is an it occupation is that is not going to exist anymore soon. Very true. All right, with that, we are done this week. And, uh, you know, here's, here's hoping that uh, Woody Allen's book gets yeah. picked up there, Look, this is why that's dumb, too. There's a thing now called self-publishing. Yeah. Woody don't need you to publish his he book. Doesn't. He doesn't. So, you know. But you know what's going to happen. Then yeah. they'll boycott Amazon. Yeah. The, 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 the book burners are going to be out in force because they do not want anyone reading his point of and view. And they will fail. He, you, here's they what's funny. Fail. Didn't have any particular intention of reading Woody's book, Love Woody's work still. Yeah. Oh, that, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a historian of Woody. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's what I want to know about Woody. Yeah. A uh, personal point of view, you know, I get very, I get very, you know, yeah. Yeah, with that kind of stuff. But now I'm going to have to buy the book. Yep. They actually make, they're, they're forcing me to buy, to, the book. to buy the book. Well, there it is. Yeah. That's the fallout. All right, everybody. Uh, have a great week. We'll see you soon. Don't, don't, and don't get the coronavirus. Just stay locked up in your house and keep listening to this life-saving podcast.